Welcome to the Cabin Culture Podcast, where we spend a little more time diving deeper into all the fun parts of cabin culture. We like to think of this as both the material and imagined expressions of how cabin lovers, dwellers, builders, and designers wish to live a more simple and authentic life. This episode is a different one. Today, we're talking to Sam, the owner, host, entrepreneur behind The Woods, Maine. We ended up talking for so long that we're cutting it into two episodes. And while Sam is the host at one of the most iconic spots in Maine, we didn't even talk about her space in much detail until episode two. Sam and Rob's background is in operations at a large company that worked to help other businesses scale. So on today's episode, we're talking about how all that experience led to the creation and growth of not only a luxury treehouse, but also a Maine-based lifestyle brand. We talk about storytelling, loss, entrepreneurship, risk, confidence, and trademarking before we ever got to building and hosting. But stick with us, because I think there are a ton of gems in these two episodes. As always, thanks for joining us every week, and I hope you enjoy it. Are you at the cabin right now? I am at the treehouse. So if you hear loud banging, it's because it's a windy day. And that's a fun fact that we're working through because every guest thinks that a moose just ran underneath the treehouse and like smashed it. Um, and Which so would be I'm a like, dream come true in my opinion. Not yes, the smashing Well, part, it's amazing. But- Some guests love the fact that the treehouse moves and that there is loud banging. And some guests are like, what did I sign up for? Yeah. And I'm like, if you didn't like it, I don't know what to tell you. You're in a tree yeah. house and it's a windy day. That's right. I feel like this is a common theme in the world of cabins is that people in theory want a cabin. They romanticize this idea of being in the woods and getting away from it all. And then they get there and you get messages and it's like, oh, there's bugs here. Yes. You're in the woods. Oh, there, I, I'm a little scared because there's no one around. Yes, you're in the woods. It's like the pieces that make it a true cabin, folks are less certain about. It's interesting because people don't know what to expect when you come across our, our treehouse. And believe it or not, a lot of the common things that people are concerned about, you don't get with us. Like they feel like they're going to be in the middle of nowhere, but you're actually not. You're on 10 acres of our private property. We reside on the property and you're three minutes from town. The yeah. other thing too with the treehouse is um, I think the biggest thing with people is um, from a weather standpoint. So the treehouse is fully operational with a backup generator. So if like, the power kicks out, it automatically kicks in. So yep. it's a fully functional home in the trees. But the banging, because of the way that the tree is connected to the tab, like I can't control the wind. So if it's banging at night, like that's part of the experience. That's right. And people, That's I think, right. are a little like, and and granted, like some people, like I am a noise person. Like if my husband's chewing, I want to literally like kill him because I can't stand the sound of chewing. Yep. Some people are sound sensitive. Yes. So we try to prepare people for that. But then, and then like, other people are like, this is the coolest thing ever. The trees are moving and this is exactly the experience I wanted. That's right. They're like, this is different than any place I've ever stayed, which is what I came for. Great. Bring on the banging. (laughs) Sam, I'm so excited to meet you. You don't know this. I actually feel like a little, I don't know if starstruck is the right word, but I feel like your place, like I've been a main lover my whole life and I found your place before we ever built Cozy Rock. And like, it was this dream place. Oh my God, I feel the same way about you. That's so funny. So I have no idea why it's taken this long to get you on the podcast. I honestly think the biggest reason is fear of reaching out to you and then being like, oh, she won't want to do the podcast. Oh my God. I've like, it's been on my radar where I was like, you know, I got to reach out to her and I'm like, but am I the right fit for what she's yes. doing? And then, and then yes. I just like seen your stuff come up and then I, you know, and I love everything that you guys are doing and I love the direction like that you've taken it beyond just like a cabin and the kind of conversations that you open it to. And then every time I was going to reach out more things like, cause you know how it is, just things grow and yep. business grow and there's only one of you. And so yeah. the timing is never aligned. And so when uh, we caught, you know, connected on, on social, I was like hundred percent in 
Yes, I was so excited. And I've been looking forward to this one for a while. And I kind of want to start there because I think to your point, that's one thing. We built the cabin and then it kind of accidentally grew into these other things like the podcast and and things like that. And you are similar in the sense that like, I actually don't know which one it started with. So I, I really want to start with overall brand as a like a, a business owner. I think this is fascinating. Yeah. But you have this luxury tree house and then you also have this brick and mortar store in Norway. You also have an online shop and you source items from all these local Maine artisans. So your shop is not just a shop for goods. It also, I feel like, spreads a love of Maine to people far outside of <clears throat> Maine. So it's grown into this community that I think I'm drawn to because it's it's centered around a love of Maine, which I feel. Can you take us back to the beginning? Did it start with one of them or did it start as this big idea? So uh, the short is my husband always makes fun of me because he goes, did we really have to build a whole tree house to start a brand? And that's really what it started with. So taking a step back, so Rob and I had always loved Treehouse Masters. We had always watched it. Uh, we had bought our property up here in Maine about eight years ago um, on the lake. And so we were renting our house while we were working in Boston. And we would always get boxed out of the best weekends in the summer. And we're like, we really need yep. to build on the property. We got to do something yep. so that we have a place to stay. And so we brought an architect out and nothing quite felt right. And then every 4th of July, we have friends and family come up and they just kind of cycle in the house throughout the week. Nobody really needs to tell us when they're coming and going. We never I had enough that. room. We never had enough room. And so... One summer, I'm sitting on the couch after everybody left 4th of July week, and I was like, okay, we need to build something. <clears throat> so when we started talking to the architects and looking at the costs, we were like, you know, Rob goes, well, you know, what if we built a treehouse? And I was like, well, let's reach out to the Nelsons, pitch our idea, see where it all falls, and just see how it goes. And so we, I sat, sat down in my office and wrote an email to the Nelsons, thinking it would take six months to hear back. Two hours, we heard back. Two weeks later, we were on the phone with Pete. Two weeks after that, he flew out from Seattle. And at that point, I equated to like when you're sitting in front of like Mr. Wonderful and you're pitching this idea yep. that you're like, really, no matter really what the offer is or what the costs are, like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like we're obviously doing it. We're freaking doing it. And so... We went ahead with the project, but the very first person I called was my good friend, Josh from Media Northeast. And I learned this from a friend of mine, Jilly Fratt at HubSpot. Go Jilly. She owns Granite Ridge uh, Barn and a state wedding, gorgeous wedding venue here in Norway. And so when she was building her property, she worked with Josh and they documented the bill process. <clears throat> so I said to Rob, the first place we're going to invest is hiring a production company because I don't care about being on TV. I don't care about uh, being on Treehouse Masters. I said, I, I can market us better than they could ever market myself. It might take me a little bit longer. I said, but I want Josh to be part of this project because he's a storyteller and I want him to tell our story through video. So Josh- You are my dream client. I own a video production company full time. And the amount of people that come to us where video is an afterthought and it's like, oh yeah, we probably need to do video versus someone at the idea stage being like, I need you to tell this story. It's literally my no, dream. No, I wanted the first cut to be caught on film. I wanted, at the time my daughter, I think was like one, I wanted her first steps on the treehouse to be caught on film. Like there were certain moments and it wasn't about us and marketing us. It was about capturing this moment in time where I was going all in on life with my husband and we were doing the damn thing. And I wanted it for her. I wanted for her when she grew up, for her to know our story, first and foremost. And then second of all, I wanted badass content to be able to market with, right? Yeah. So Josh was like 100% on board. So yeah. we signed up with Josh. And then the next call I made is I'd always been finding uh, following anchor in Lewiston. And this was like five yep. years ago. And so I said at some point in my life, because again, anchor is just an incredible agency and their storytelling for their clients is just remarkable. And so I was like, I really want anchor to be a part of this from a branding standpoint to brand us, but really understand our story, our vision, how we are, how we want to be in our community, how we want to show up every day. Mm -hmm. And so those were the two places that we invested in. 
So we worked with Anchor and the team on our branding and the gorgeous illustrations. And we just thought we would be the tree house. And then... <laughs> Can I pause you right yeah. there before you go any further? Yeah. I feel like this is the most, there's two things here, but the most important takeaway for people listening is that if you're planning a build and you have a dream and you do want to grow it, investing in marketing or documentation at the beginning is almost more Essential. important. Yes. I feel like people put it off and then they're like, I can't hire photographers for the first year because I spent all this money on the build. But I'm like, dude, I'm throwing 10 grand at a hot tub. Why would I not throw 10 grand at someone who could help capture it and tell the story? Like, I feel like that gets missed a lot. So I so I used, in, in my previous life, I used to work for a company called HubSpot. Both my husband and I did. We were at HubSpot for almost a decade, uh, over a decade combined. And one of the best companies to work for, one of the hardest decisions for both him and I to leave and do this because it was such a safety net. But we're like, here we are. We're just going to do the damn thing. So I used to tell my clients this and I really, it was, it was how it was 90% truth, 10% a sales tactic at the time going out on my own and doing what we did. I now eat my words every single day and I truly stand by them. I used to tell my customers, yes, it's going to cost you more, but it's an upfront investment for longer term success. And I used to say that. And part of it was like to close the deal. But that's what it is. Like, mm -hmm. it is, if I'm going to roll the dice on an investment I make, I'm going to bet on us. I'm going to bet on Rob and myself. Rob always says I back the right horse, right? Because both him and I are a team and we put our money out there but then we know what we're going to do with that. And it's about being strategic and thoughtful with your investments. It's yeah. not, and, and it's about finding the right partner to tell your story. And it's yes. about finding the right agency to brand you. And yes, yes. does that cost money? Absolutely. freaking -lutely. Does it cost money to protect that with trademarks and IP? Absolutely. But that is putting you in a position to take your investments and protect them, but also put you in a position to win and that's yeah. a re and it's scary and you're standing on that ledge and you're like shit how is this gonna go and this is a lot of money and it's a lot of time and and it's really scary well nothing easy is not scary it's gonna be scary you just gotta friggin do it yeah okay i want to ask more there's so many technical questions i want to ask yeah. there but i want to back up for one second yeah because you said something i want to be clear i don't cry easily but you said something i'm to get emotional right now, but you said something a minute ago. You said, I wanted to document us going all in on life. And I feel like that is the core of like why Sean and I do what we do because I lost my mom and that's how it all started. When I lost her, she left Welcome us money. Yep. I know. I read, I read your pre-interview. And so I want to talk about that a little bit because I feel like- yes. I'm privileged in that she was able to leave me money and that bought my first cabin. And mm. then my grandparents died and that bought the second one. Mm. But the part of me, the biggest takeaway was that my mom was frugal her whole life saving for retirement so that she could travel and live out her retirement dreams and she didn't make it to retirement. And so when I got that money, I was like, there's a couple things I could do with this. I could put it into a savings account or a Roth IRA and like, which I have a Roth, like we're responsible too, but... <laughs> But I can also, like, I don't want to wait until I'm retired to build my dream cabin. And I've never described it that way. But when you said, I wanted to document us going all in on life, it just feels like that's what we were doing. So I started three business lines in three years. Online, hospitality. I should say we. Rob and I started three business lines <laughs> in three years. Rob always, Rob's, Rob's Mr. Mysterioso. He hides out in the background. This is Sean. Through... <laughs> This whole, I will say I've been on a quite a bit of journey since I lost my mom almost 14 years ago. I've lost both my parents. Um, in the last three years, I would say three to four years, I've done a lot of work on myself, particularly because I now have a six-year-old and I don't want my shit to be her shit. And we're going a little yeah. off of cabins here. <clears throat> but no, I love that. I don't want um, what, what I refer to her with her, like mommy's trying to change her patterns. Uh, my patterns, my, my stressors, my anxiety, I'm trying not to get ch choked up here. Um, the things that have shaped and molded me from a place of fear to be her shit to carry on. 
So I've done a lot of work on myself in that sense. And so when I look back at all the sacrifices that my mom made for me in her life and the people that came before me and the position that they put me in to do anything less with my life, in my opinion, is to do a disservice to them and their memory. The other thing that I know is that it could all be gone tomorrow. Yep. Yep. And so I... I'm wearing this bracelet. There's a really cool company called My Intent. Have you ever heard of My Intent? Uh-uh. So one of my one of the girls that worked for me at my shop, I love her. She lost one of her daughters. Uh, she told me somebody somebody had given her one that said strength. And the idea is that they customize them and you put your intent on the bracelet. And so every year I choose a word uh to focus on. Three years ago, it was uh it was the word focus and I became so focused, I became out of balance. So the next year my word was balance. Mm -hmm. And then last year my word was fearless. Mm -hmm. And this year my word is joy. Mm. And the reason for that is because through going through this process and documenting this process and doing this, I'm doing it for Andy because I want Andy to be able to know and learn the way in which I've transformed my life because of my losses Mm -hmm. in being fearless in being appreciative in being grateful for the things that I have and the risks that I take and creating a life, leaving the corporate world. Me and my husband, I used to get so mad at Rob. How come you're not getting more upset about this? Why aren't you more involved in the business? I started three business lines in three years because what I was realizing is that I was running away from dealing with my own grief. And so I was pouring it all into the business like a crazy spinning compass, trying Mm -hmm. to make it all, to make my life make sense. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize was when my mom died, I felt like my compass was smashed and I had to figure out how to put it all together. But what I didn't realize is I need to pick up the pieces, put it in a box and honor it for what it was. And I need to calibrate my own compass, <laughs> but it's taken me a long time to do that. And that's why this crazy lady and her husband started three businesses in three years because my husband's unbelievably supportive of this crazy person that has gotten us to this crazy point in my life. Yeah. But I now understand the why of what I do. Yeah. But now yeah. I need to do it in a healthier way and live life in joy. Yeah. And not out of a place of fear. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can relate to that. Tangent. But I sorry if this No, I feel like it's so important because I think a lot of people in my life thought I was crazy for the first cabin and like, oh, you're gonna spend your entire inheritance on a cabin. And I was like, spend or invest. That's but the then thing the is that people thing- don't understand that. But but that's the I other know. thing too, is if you're going to do it, you do it. Go all in. Yes. Like you yes. have to I'm not gonna have to you have to understand that you're making an investment, but what it's going to do is you could put it in something and it make like, you know, two percent, three percent, whatever it is, the stock market could go up, whatever it is. But if you're going to invest it in, in a cabin or some sort of passion or whatever it is, you're gonna have to put that sweat equity in. And that's what people yeah. don't expect. Yeah. Yeah, because it's called passive income in so many places. People just talk about it as passive income. And it's like, well, it's not exactly what it is. But I also feel like it's not just investing financially. And it is that. And if you are risk averse to finances, that's the way that you can kind of talk yourself into it. But it's also investing. I just I can't stop thinking about the way you described it. It's about investing in like now versus 20 years from now. Because if you put it in a Roth IRA, yes, you will have more in 20 years, but same with the cabin, you can, but you also have had 20 years worth of experiences yourself and all the people that you've been able to host there who've had the experiences, this thing you've created. And that's going back to marketing. That's how I think about marketing. It's not about like growing numbers or revenue. It's about like, how do more people find out about this experience that they could have? If we want to fill our calendar and really share it with other people, how do we help the right people find out about it? And you have done such a good job at that. Thank you. What's interesting is, is that we're not on Airbnb. We've never really been on Airbnb. That's one of my questions. I noticed that. Because I, well, there's a couple reasons for that. One, I said to myself, I want Part of it, like part of it was just like, 
my own crazy, like, can I do this without Airbnb? Oh, and you have. (laughs) The other part of it was being able to book somebody, take that revenue and reinvest it in real time without, people don't understand that when you book through an Airbnb, the host does not get that revenue at that time. Fees get taken out and they are paid out at the time of your stay. Not that anybody needs to know that, but if you're going to get into this market, you're going to be a host. You need to understand that that's how it works. Yeah. Not doing that allowed us to invest on the brand side and building the brand. Oh, because you got the money earlier. Real so time. you were filling up all those. So yeah, we, got so it. So what I did was, so we worked for a company called HubSpot. And so at the time I was in uh, services and then I, my last year there, I moved over to a sales uh, role for the last year, starting a sales team um, for about 12 months. I worked on a upsell cross sell team. But one of the things I did was I spun up the treehouse account on my, in, in HubSpot and I would actually demo to my clients how you would actually use the product and the software. So it was awesome. And so I did that, but then I started to integrate a reservation system and see how that worked and stuff like that. Mm. And so that's how it started to go that route to avoid Airbnb. So I was doing product demos with like reservation systems. And so for us, that's how, that's how it worked. And then I was like, I am going to go to market. I'm going to generate my own PR. I'm going to generate our revenue and stuff without Airbnb. And then I was like, how long can we do this? Yeah. Ourselves? And so we've been able to do it. Do I think that we could potentially book more, but we were never looking for 30 nights of turnover with our yeah. brand. We were looking for quality guests to come in, to experience it and become part of the story. And Believe it or not, we've only stayed in our treehouse maybe three or four nights ever in the last Because it's so years. it's so booked. No, because Rob and I actually don't even think about the treehouse. We truly believe like uh-huh. I know one of my missions, I know I was put on this earth to help people and the capacity in which I do that. I think is yet still to be realized. I just know that that's my mission is to help people. I think we will we built this for other people. The energy on the property is so healing and transforming that I feel like this place just, I I believe in energies and I believe this place attracts people in times in their life when they need it and they leave leaving clarity. Yeah. Um, And so that's how we feel. And like when we think about our brand and I will stand by this, time and time again, we are in the business of marketing our town and our community and we're a destination along the way. And I say that all the time because I truly believe that we are on the cusp of one of our biggest brand moves. Um, I know Hmm. this is the first time talking about it publicly. Oh, Um, I'm so intrigued. And I have no idea when this would air. So let's just make sure that it airs. Um, It'll be in a month. You're okay, safe. perfect. <laughs> um, we are actually opening up a flagship location right here on Norway. Um, we have our, so when we decided to open up the retail storefront, I decided it in April that we were going to do it. I'm going to quit. I was like, I quit my job. And I said, we're going to open up a retail storefront because there's something about being online, but there's something about turning your lights on every day that really is being part of the community. And so Rob was like, we're doing what? And I was like, yeah, this was three years ago. He goes, and what are we opening? It? He goes, six weeks. He goes, do we have a space? And I go, no. So I went door to door because this was during COVID. And I was like, hi, how are things going for you? <laughs> Is your shop going to, to, find a space, to find a space? And I finally came across uh, this property management company that had a storefront who I love my pro- the property manager. And I said to him, you don't need this storefront. You're a property management company. And so I went in every day for a week. <laughs> and the last day I brought a tape measure and I started measuring his walls. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, just in case you change your mind. And so he said, you know what? You can have my space. So within six weeks, we opened up our store. Now our store is not, uh, was not the space that I needed, it, but it, it was perfect for what we were at the time. But as the business has grown, and particularly online, it's really challenging to fill online orders and reach and manage a retail space out of like 600 square feet. 
Yes, so yes. We I have am... clients who do this and they all have expanded to like storage units and like warehouses. So we have like we a separate warehouse, but it's a third floor walk up. Not ideal when you have oh, like 75 God. boxes and you're just like lifting them up. But yeah. your uh, UPS man probably doesn't like that. or the UPS No, they just leave it. At, I would never do that to them because I love them too okay. much. So it's just basically my husband cursing me. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so and my, you know, and my part time employees. Uh, but I. We are we were approached uh, two weeks ago to take over a space in the historic opera house. Uh, here in downtown Norway, there's like four or five amazing shops, some of which have been there the last 10 years. And it literally is an absolute dream come true. But we are hoping to open our new flagship location May 1st, which is two doors down, 400 Main Street in downtown so will Norway. will you still have the other one or you'll move to that we one? We are going to keep operations going uh, to okay. April 30th. And I am going to somehow in the next eight weeks open up the Woods Main flagship Oh my God. I'm looking at pictures right now of the opera house. Cause I was like, I need to see a it's picture so of it. It's so amazing. But it is. The it's most so amazing? New England. Do you know what's so amazing about the opera house? They have the what? most incredible board and they are trying to fundraise to restore the opera house. So it brings back theater and culture to downtown Norway and to I be a part that. of that mission now and to that. be a part of that space, um, yeah. to be able to help make that vision a reality in any way that I possibly can, I feel called to do it and I'm going to do it. Like I, hell yeah. You'll have to come up if we do it like a soft. I want you so much because I've never even, honestly, I've never been to Norway and all I know about Norway is the woods main. Like oh that's God. how I first discovered it. That's how I like, and I've so, never been there. Like there are the most amazing places to eat you've got the cutest stores and handmade Maine is all Maine made products and handmade Maine. We don't carry all Maine made products. That's a handmade Maine thing. For us, we highlight women owned businesses, black owned businesses, growing businesses. Yep. Um, you've got fiber and vine, which is a wine and knitting store, which is amazing. Oh my God. You've got, um, you've got the Raven collection. She does the most like she's got crystals and you've got healing uh, pathways uh, Hidden Pathways to Healing, which is amazing. Wittishens Antique Store. So cool. Directly. Oh, I love antiquing. You're only an hour from Freeport. Why have we never been there? I don't know. The restaurants. Okay. But even beyond that, hiking at all of like Roberts and Shepherd's Farm Preserve. But what's really cool is Rob, it's part of the Western Foothills Land Trust. Roberts uh, Farm Preserve has a warming hut and you can uh, for free get snowshoes and cross-country skis in the winter. Uh, and then even cooler on Friday nights, the Allen Day Community Garden, which is an amazing organization if you haven't heard about it. They do this outdoor um, farmer's market, but then they do firewood pizza. And if you can afford pizza, you can donate to buy your pizza. Or if you can't, you can just come and have pizza and listen to music God, and this. just the community. That, but that's why we moved here is because having lost my parents, my in-laws are down in Mass, having lost my parents and my family being far away. I never thought I'd be living in Norway, Maine. Like we were two, literally three minutes from signing a contract in Portland. If at all, we were going to move anywhere out of Boston. I was like, I'm a city girl. There's no way you're going to ever find me in Western Maine. And when we started this treehouse project, the electricians on the project, the excavators on the project, my best friend is the wife of the excavator that was on this project up here. Is that was, how you met her? Yes. Wow. And so the people that worked on this project, I said to myself, if something ever happened to me, if something ever happened to Rob, what would Andy do? I don't worry about that. This community mm -hmm. will rally around my husband if something happens to me. They will rally around my child. And I know that this community will embrace, embrace them. And for me, I don't care where I am in the world. If that is something that I can say, I want to live and invest my time yeah. and energy into that community. Yes. And this is, I think, the piece that's often missed when we start talking about short-term rental regulations. And I wanted to ask about that yes. just because I do think that when done right, rentals can contribute 
back to the community as much as the community contributes to folks who are traveling there and getting to enjoy the area. Now, the problem is I don't think every host views it that way or puts the time and energy into engaging in the community in the way that you do. So do you have any, to me, it seems like it's just your heart that's driven this, but do you have any thoughts or tips for folks? Because a lot of folks we talk to live somewhere else and then built their cabin in a different location, myself included, no judgment. Do you have um, any like, advice for them on how they integrate with their community more or ways to get started if they're not? I would say, what makes your soul happy? Mm. Sit there, sit with yourself and say, what makes my soul happy? If I sit here, is it gardening? Is it whatever, you know, is it music? Is it <clears throat> crafting? Is it animals? Is it whatever it is? And then seek out one organization in the community in which your Airbnb or cabin resides in. And whether it's donating your time, whether it's donating money, whether it's donating expertise, if you're in marketing, if mm -hmm. you're in accounting, if you're whatever it is, just carve out a little time in your busy world. Why? A couple things happen. You build a community connection and you give back. Two, it's something that you enjoy because you sat with your soul. Mm -hmm. And three, it's going to feed you and you're going to be able to operate out of a place of joy. And to be honest with you, the value that that recipient receives is going to be so much far greater than you could even imagine. Yeah. And I just feel like that is just like a very simple way of putting it because yeah. then it can flourish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you do that. Hold on. I've written it down where you donate, but you donate a portion of your profits to, you can probably tell me it's the in Western my notes here. Somewhere. Yeah. Yes, so we right. were doing that. So when we were small, we were doing that with Western Foothills Land Trust. The problem with me is that I want to get to everybody. So <laughs> we are restructuring on how we're going to do that, but we do contribute to Western Foothills Land Trust as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, but our Have you done that since day one? Was that like part of your original That was part of our, of you know, it was not, part yeah. of like all of our apparel. Now it's like our green hoodie that we do that for. Um, we're trying to figure out, I'm trying to carve it out so that it's a little bit more tracked and accurate and all of that stuff. But really for us, I want to figure out, is there a way that we have something that donates back to the opera house on a regular basis? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't even know if it's necessarily like the apparel piece where we give like a piece back of like the apparel so much so as like, could we use our marketing firepower for some of these organizations yeah. to really help them out? So like one of the things that I've really, um, we, we get, we probably get five to seven donation requests a day, wow. which is really- For like silent auctions and events everything. and things like it's that. It's very yeah. community things. It's very, very hard to say no, but I've gotten to a point where now it's so saturated and right. that it's very hard to say yes to. You can't everything. say yes to all of them. Yeah. But there are certain things that we carved out. And one that I've, I said to Rob, which is super important to me is- um, helping children who have lost parents, um, children's and mm. children and adults. So <clears throat> we rarely donate the tree house um, as an auction item. It's a very high value auction item. Um, but we actually have started to work with um, the Center for Grieving Children in Portland and they just had their love gala and they said it was one of the highest fetching items, but we donated the tree house to that. And I said, well, you can count yeah. on us again for next year because yeah. There are certain things like loss is one thing. That's the one thing that's crazy that, you know, they say like loss is one thing that connects every single person and every single soul on this planet. Mm -hmm. And you need to stop and think about that. If it's not you, it's someone else. Like we're all going to experience it. That's right. And it affects us in different ways and it affects our journeys in different ways. So it's like, how can you help people and change the perspective on loss for people that can help yeah. them heal, get to a place of healing and use that as yeah. a superpower, use, yes. using someone like, as a superpower? Because I do kind of feel like it is because I, I so have many times too saying that, right? You what? 
But sometimes do you feel bad about saying that where you're like, you know, oh, I, say yeah. my, I say my mom does more for me where she is now than she could have ever done on this earth. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting to think about. I just know that I had never experienced significant loss. She was the first significant loss in my life and will probably be the hardest of my life minus like maybe a spouse. But, um, but once I had that experience, the way that I'm able to treat other people who've experienced loss or connect with them or support them if a family member is sick, whereas I had no idea how to do that before because it would just make me uncomfortable. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you or, or do to support you, but I feel like once you go through it, you're like, no, I've got some ideas. Like I can show up for you in a way that so few other people can. hundred percent. Like I feel like my next career is, mm-hmm. is to help people grow their business, help in that capacity. But I also feel like there needs to be a significant shift in having the uncomfortable conversation about loss. This is what I want to make a documentary about. It's a little secret that no one wants to talk about. The other thing I equate that to is like parenthood. I don't know why women don't talk about the dirty, ugly shit about being a parent. Because you know, here I go to therapy after having a child thinking I have postpartum. And they're like, no, this is circumstantial. I'm like, then no, why didn't anybody tell me this? It's right. the same if thing. If everyone else boss, is experiencing this, it's like, the what? same why thing with boss. I don't know why we don't talk about it, but it is a driver. And you, you look at some of these amazing entrepreneurs in their life. And really what it is, is it was rooted from running away from dealing with loss yes. that they threw yes. their whole selves into a project. And while yep. it looks spectacular, on the inside, they're a freaking ball of mush. I know. I know. And people, but people want you to be strong. Like I remember someone saying to me in the year after my mom died, like, oh, you're so brave. You're so strong. No, you know, I'm, and they didn't say it quite like this, but like, I'm, I'm glad it happened to you because you can handle it. And I was like, no, no. So the reality is, is like, I can't handle it. That's just all happening inside. And what you've reinforced to me is that if I show it to you on the outside, that will be a problem. So you are rewarding me for being able to lock all those feelings on the inside and not letting you see them. And I learned that lesson day and day again. They're like, oh, where's where's the Janice that we know and love? When is she coming back? And and you you get rewarded for being back to normal or creating something big and not talking about those feelings. I can see why it all happens. I don't know the answer to fixing oh, it, yeah. but trust me when I, when I look back and was like, oh, wow, creating a brand, a retail store, an online shop and a hospitality experience while having a two to three year old at the time. Yep. I was definitely running away from something Yeah, and trying to fill yeah. the gap of that. And then like to do the hard work and look in inward, I feel like was for Andy, our daughter and to yeah. be better for her, but also to be better for me, because I will never forget. I had a, an amazing, <clears throat> he was a, an executive at HubSpot, Dan Tyre. Love Dan. <clears throat> he is like my Arizona lava. He's got this gorgeous house in Arizona. I visit him and his wife. You know, when it gets super cold out in Arizona, they call yeah. it the Misabni winter getaway out there. And Sedona has incredible energy out there. Like mm. the healing energy of Arizona is just, it's insane. But I remember I called him a couple of years ago. It was like two years ago. And I said, Dan, I need executive coaching. I've got this business that's growing and I'm trying to figure out what to do next and all this stuff. And he said, wait, he goes, the Sam Masabni that got you to this point is not the Sam Masabni that's going to serve you moving forward. Before you could do any executive coaching, you need to work with my wife, Amy, who does mind body coaching and you need to work on some healing. And I will never forget that conversation. And I started working with his wife, Amy, on doing mind-body coaching. And it put me on the journey of like going to therapy for the first time in whatever yeah. years. And and all of these other, like physically taking care of myself and mentally taking care of myself and changing my pathways. So that as an executive, as a CEO, as a brand builder, I could show up better for myself, for my husband, for my daughter, for our employees, so that I can serve us better as we grow. Yeah. But it was super interesting because here I thinking I need executive coaching because I have no idea what's going on in my business when I actually need to get my shit together. Sounds like you're a couple years ahead of me. 
<laughs> right. But no, but like this, but I feel like these conversations need to come out, especially if you're an entrepreneur yeah. that is reeling from loss. Because yeah. Because you can cover it up with a whole bunch of other things. I did the same so thing last year. You don't I know. realize that your coping mechanisms, it's, it's just my drive in business. I'm just a very driven person. Yeah. I'm just ambitious. That's right. And that's okay. But are you ambitious from a place of being healthy and balanced? I know. Are you doing it from a place of a wounded child? And this is why I don't let guests ask questions, Sam, because that is not a question I'm ready to answer. <laughs> right. You don't have to answer it. We're just throwing it out into the universe. That's right. All of you listeners can think about that. Good luck with it. I, on the other hand, am still manipulating my therapist to avoid anything hard that she might want to talk about. So I got to tell you, dig in. Dig in. The I journey know. is the journey is crazy. The jur I I won't even I won't even scare everybody with like the journey that I've been on and the crazy spiritual like stuff. Like I am not I am not a religious person, but I do have faith in the universe. I do have like I not rooted. I believe in universe. I believe in the energy. I believe in the power of manifestation. That has mm -hmm. all changed and solidified probably in the last six weeks for me, the power of manifestation. Wow. Yeah. Pretty really? Recent. Yeah. Is that the opera house? That No. That well, that was like, that was like the the second biggest proof of that. The first wow. biggest proof is when we landed the cover of Yankee magazine. Oh, I was going to ask about that. I mean, yes, I was just with Pam last week and we talked about it a lot and she brought a copy. And so we like looked through it and it was just that picture on the front is like Holy the crap, best. Right. So I didn't know that was coming out. Spot. You didn't know you were going to be on the cover? No, they didn't tell me. What? So Okay, best surprise ever. Freaking unbelievable. So one of the goals that I'd had, because I've always done my own PR, like I pitched the Harrows myself, like, and I have had friends in PR that have like helped me out and hooked me up here and there or whatever. So one of the goals that I've always had was to lay on the cover of Yankee. I don't know why, but it was just like in my mind, I'm like, I built this beautiful thing. It would be so pretty on the cover. And, and it was. <laughs> so I've gone at several angles and I'm like, I see everybody else going like around me. And, and then, you know, I've tried to do the non-comparison thing all the time yeah. and, and everything like that. And so one of the concepts with manifestation is that the more you try to control and make it happen, you're actually putting negative vibrations out into the universe. The idea is to release the idea is to say, I surrender this and kind of give it up and you're able to raise your vibration, thus attracting more of what you want. Gabby Bernstein's, uh, what is it? Super attractor. I'm going to give Gabby Bernstein a shout out here. I just finished her book and I don't even read, but it took me a year, but I put it there. <laughs> um, it. Gabby Bernstein. But so the idea is that you do that. And unbeknownst to me, because we got so focused on other projects and launches like our Chappie Rap collaboration, everything like that. Mm -hmm. It took me off the path of this Yankee magazine. But one of the goals I had in 2023 was to land the cover of Yankee. And of course, how are you going to do that without pitching? Right? Like you have to do right. it yourself. Like nobody. That's what I would think for you. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. Well, on New Year's Eve, on the 31st, the last day of the year, I turn my phone over when I wake up and my phone is blowing up and my mother-in-law goes, did you see it? And I go, see what? And she sends me a picture of it and I just burst into tears. And in that moment, it didn't require me. Pam and Chris gave me that gift. They gave me that moment and that life box checked. Yeah. And they did something for me that I have wanted and worked towards. And it showed me that if you trust in the universe and in the energy, it doesn't have to come from you, but it can yeah. come from things that you've done and it can yeah. emanate back to you. So literally on the last day of the month, and I had a, a foundational shift in my confidence and my ability to trust again, to let my guard down, to not do everything from a place of fear and anxiety and say, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Mm. Rob and I were saying, I literally was in tears saying, our space is going to break. Our business is going to break come Q4. If we stay in our current space, I don't know what we're going to do. And he goes, just trust, have faith. Two hours later, we get a phone call with someone approaching us about a bigger space. And so it's 
for me, letting go of control because I'm a control freak. Me too. Hardest thing to do. It's so hard. But it goes back to that concept of what you were saying. Uh, if to a cabin builder and people come to you from a production standpoint after the fact, it's going to cost us $10,000. It's going to, yeah. whatever it is. If it's the right thing to do and you do it, trust that the fruits of that will right. show up. It's an up right. investment for longer term success. Same thing with having faith in it. Now, there's nothing to say that you're like, one day I'm just going to randomly show up on the cover of Ma Yankee Magazine. Things had to happen. I am a weird, I've turned into a place where like, I don't need to have content creators come in and do stuff at our treehouse anymore. That's not something that I seek out to do. I'm, I'm someone who admires people's storytelling, their vision, their images. And so I'm like a dirty little collector. So there's a couple <laughs> out there and Chris and Pam were one of my dirty little collectors I wanted to have in my like personal photography of yeah. my space. Um, uh, C Funk is another one. Uh, he's yeah. awesome. And so yeah. he came in and I wanted his take on my space. And so I reach out to people and have them come and stay because I just love how they interpret the space. Right. It's my own thing. Right. It's not. And then the benefit is they share it with their audience. That's but right. But for me, it's just, I want my dirty little collection of awesome photographers. Which um, I do feel like dirt and glass are the best storytellers out there. There's something about the way they're in the photos that doesn't make you look at them. It makes you real. feel like you are them or you want to be them. And it just like, they tell the story. But that, I think that that's, that's the thing is it, it's not necessarily about having someone come in that's got you know, 10 million followers and this, that, and the other thing, you have to sit with someone. And if there's somebody that you admire, reach out to them. And if they, and, and don't be like, let's just do this and trade, pay them for yeah. their time and their effort. They're not yeah. coming, like Agreed. they're coming in and enjoying their space, but they're doing a job. Agreed. And so, yeah. and that's the thing is like that. I think that's the other thing that gets lost too with people is that they don't want to, to put it out there, but you need to figure out what is the value to you. Like, what is, what is it? Are you just going to use these for marketing assets? Is this something that you want just because you want their pictures in a collection? Um, that's, you know, when, when you're talking to people that, I think the biggest thing is that people think that they could just like bring people into the space and, you know, some people want to do it in trade or whatever it is because it's like fun. God bless it. That's That's awesome. Yep. But if someone is, is coming in and they're putting the time, effort, putting the equipment in and really telling a story, it's worth every penny. Yeah. Because you never know where it's going to happen. Like last day of the I year. I know. I know. Like I, I reached out to them and I'm like, you guys have no idea like what a life moment you gave me in coming to my space, like a life. But that's what's so amazing about what it is that we do is and the people that we cross paths with. You never know how they're gonna impact and shape your life. I know. And vice versa. I think we've talked about this before, but that's why I love reading our guest book so much because you know, you just see a name and how many reviews they have when they book and you just don't really know much about them if you're booking on Airbnb. And then they show up and then you get this intimate guest book message that tells you what brought them there, that tells you the healing that happened there, that tells you what they're taking with them to their life back at home. And you don't know any of that from the moment they book, you know? Yeah. And some people never write that. Like we've had a couple guests recently didn't write anything in the guest book, which is totally up to them. But it, it makes me wonder, it doesn't mean they didn't have an experience, but what are all the things under the surface that we don't know about that we're doing that shape their experience or that they're doing that will shape our experience? Who knows who they're going to tell about it when they go home and what that will do? I know. It's interesting They like because the one downside to not being on Airbnb is like we don't have like a place where you can leave reviews for us. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. Um, like yeah. we do have reviews on our site, but I don't think like we've had a review in like years just because we don't send out emails asking for them or soliciting. Yeah. Them. But again, I think that's like a different weird take for me is like, I don't look at this as a revenue revenue generator. Yes, it is inherently it is. Yeah. But I feel like it's a soul generator. Like yeah. it's like a soul refuel. And so like people that stay here, we're drawn to here for a reason, for their own journey, for their own path, for their own reason. And so while reviews would be nice and I probably should send them out uh, or like have them posted somewhere, like 
the treehouse, that's what's so crazy about this brand is the treehouse has become secondary to the brand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know which I, I found never, first. I think I found the treehouse first, but the shop was like right around the same time. I, was I never saw the overall coming. brand. What was crazy is, so we had this Norway long sleeve t-shirt and we put it in the window at the bookstore in downtown Norway. And we sold out of our t-shirts within like the first couple hours. So she called me back and she said, Hey, can you bring some more of these t-shirts down? So I was like, yeah. So then we started designing other t-shirts and a couple other things, putting in her bookstore and she would sell them. And then I said to Rob, this was during COVID. I'm like, I think we may have a brand or something. So she said, do you want to have a little corner of my store? So we had a rack, two chairs, another rack. And so I said, sure. And then Sea Bags, I reached out to Sea Bags to design my collection on Sea Bags, our first, our first vintage collection, our original collection. And they did. And so we did that. And then within six months, they opened up a store called Brick and Mortar, which was a home store. Yeah. And they said, Do you want to open with us? Because we had a big social media mm -hmm. following. Do you want to do you want to have like 200 square feet in the store and open with us? I said, Oh my God, this would be amazing. So at the time. I had left my job. Rob had left a year before me. He left HubSpot a year before me to do daddy daycare. And so then I said, this was, I said, yes, let's open. So we opened in October, I think it was three, no, four years ago in brick and mortar, which is actually the same space I'm moving back to in a couple of weeks, which is really crazy. in the opera house. Yes. Okay. Wait. So you opened your brick and mortar in October of 2020. Pre-vaccines during COVID. Yes. That is so ballsy. So we opened in the corner there. And then I was like, I don't know what's going to happen with the treehouse, with COVID and everything like that. So let, I'm going all in on this brand situation. So we opened up like in the corner with brick and mortar in a tiny little space. We went through Christmas with them. And I said to Rob, we need our own shop. And he's like, Jesus, when is that going to happen? Two months in. And then three months later was that April when I so started knocking on everybody's door. We yeah. opened in June 1st. And so fast forward, it's been three years. And now we're moving into brick and mortar, back into the whole store and making it our flagship. Yep. So it's crazy. It started with a t-shirt three years ago. So this is my question because I have thought about making Cozy Rock merch just for like guests or whatever. And even that feels hard for me. I'm it's like, who would buy? Yeah. Like who would want to buy something with our logo on it that I designed on Canva? So how did you get the confidence to be like, not only will people want that, but like I can grow it. And you were totally right. Like it's happening. But at that moment, what did it take to have the confidence to do that? Um, I think that if I actually knew what it would take to do everything that we've done, if I actually knew, I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have done it. Um, yeah. Because it is a lot of work. It's a lot of commitment and it's consistency. It's yeah. being consistent and pushing through. I mean, I can't tell you half the reason Rob and I have been married 15 years together, 18, I don't even know anymore, is because 99% of the time I'm on the floor crying, going, what did I do with our lives? And he's taking the shovel going, all right, it's time to get up. Or he's like, hey, why don't you have this wink or something and just unwind? You know what I mean? Like, he yeah. is literally because it's freaking hard. So hard. This so sounds like our life. It's like my ratio is a little bit different. It's like 90% of the time I'm fine. And I'm like, go, 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 build, build, build. We can do this. And then 10% of the time I'm just a sobbing mess. And Sean is like, what has happened? And then no, he takes it's, care it's of me. No, it's crazy. But I think like when I got to the point and was like, we should do it is like, when I realized like we're all in, like we left our nine to five, our one of the best companies to work for in the world. We both, yeah. left. we are doing this damn thing. Like no health insurance, like figuring this shit out. I have always had the best of health insurance, best of companies, everything. And I'm like, we're gonna freaking do this. And I think part of it was there's two things. There's one thing that made me truly fearless. And that was giving birth. <laughs> mm. Wait, after you gave birth, you were like, I'm no longer afraid of anything well, or going into giving birth? At this birth. point in my life, nothing is worth it giving birth and like maybe the first 18, 18 months of having a child. So I'm yeah. literally like, if I survive this, 
branding some t-shirts and trying to sell them is like so freaking easy. Like that's like my gauge. Every time I find okay. something to be extremely challenging, scary, painful, it is no worse than going through pregnancy, giving Which you've already done in the first 18 months. Okay. I've done none of those things. So that might not be what gets me to do right. this. But I'm saying like for me, like, for you, really yeah. looking at this and going like, I, I, I birthed a human, which is the most unnatural, natural thing, supposedly. <laughs> like, I mean, this is just my experience. God bless everybody that loves it. Um, that for me, it was, it, you know, Rob always says life is all about perspective. And so if you put things into perspective versus like, you know, birthing a child compared to birthing a brand, honestly, yeah. One is significantly harder, in my opinion. You're like, I got this. Yep. Like, and the stakes are lower. I mean, hey, somebody might just be able to have a child super easy, and birthing a company would be impossible. But to me, it's like it's way easier to do that yes. than it would be to be a parent. Right. Um, doing it together is insane. But I yes. think that I think you know the other thing that I think is really important though when it comes to branding when it comes to thinking about these things is protecting that brand, protecting that name and protecting the property. And I think that this is something that is significantly missed. It costs a shit ton of money to trademark if you're gonna do it the right way. I didn't know that you can't just trademark a phrase. It has to be in certain classes and certain, you know, people don't understand the investments in the times. Yes, you can do it. But if you really are gonna do the damn thing, if you're really going to brand apparel, you're really going to go out there and really create a holistic brand, you need to protect that brand and invest in that. And so that was one of the other biggest upfront investments that we had. We actually just secured our 22nd, 22nd trademark yesterday. Wait, so do you have to renew it? No, 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 wait. Okay, how does that work? Talk us through it. For those yeah. of us who are like, okay, I hear you. This is probably important. How do we do that and how much yeah. does it cost? So I actually went with an actual trademark attorney. Okay. Um, so I went through uh, an amazing um, firm that, that specializes in trademarks because I wanted to make sure I did it the right way because something like the Pines uh, could be found in a lot of places. Yeah. you know, potentially. So I wanted yeah. to make sure that like I was full, fully cleared everything like that. But what's interesting is, is I want to put the pines on a hat or a sweatshirt and then I want to put it on my pillows and yep. I wanted to put it on my blankets and I want to put it on jewelry and I want to put it on bags. Those are like four or five different classes. So it's a filing for each trade. Oh my God. So we own the phrase, the woods, in real estate, apparel, bags, home collection. We own the Pines as standalone brand mark in apparel, brand, home collection, jewelry, blankets, uh, real estate, a few other things. But then we also trademarked phrases like from the seas to the trees. We just got issued what is going to end up being our company ethos for both Treehouse and Apparel, which is Comfort Elevated. That's going to be our brand line now is that we're Comfort Elevated because that's what we are. We want you to feel warm and cozy, but we want to be that next step up. Yes. Um, and so comfort, high end cozy. Yeah. And then it also works on cozy level of being in a treehouse and being elevated. So you're yes. elevated in a treehouse. I love this. So, but we filed for that in all of the classes, apparel, real estate, bag. Um, so this is like ongoing. Every time you come up with a new idea, you go back to your lawyer and have them do yes, the trademark I am for that. done trademarking for a little while. But part okay. of that is one of the, you know, when I started this, I never thought we'd be doing any of this. And part of what I have is I have a lot of different strengths, but I also have a lot of different, um, I don't want to call them we uh, weaknesses, but I... I blind spots. Yeah. Um, I love that word. And so part of that is, is, you know, I don't want to be in the manufacturing of my apparel for the rest of my life. I don't want to have to be, I want to sit at a place where I get to be creative, where I get to separate some of my time from this business to talk to people who have lost people or talk to people about how they build their business. And in doing that, that's going to require someone coming in and let's say investing in the company or, yeah. but it will always be even if I sell a piece of the company or I do a big licensing deal 
or which is what I dream of doing, like my tree home collection by Martha Stewart. Martha, if you watch the podcast, I want to do a tree home collection with you and putting that out into the universe. Did you just say if Martha Stewart watches the podcast? Yes. Do you think we get Martha to watch the podcast? Sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure she's already one of our listeners. Definitely, we should have. Hit us up, Martha. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. But my my idea is that if you want to do those things and like the collaborations that we have, whether it's with Chappie Rap or otherwise, you have to protect your partners too. Yeah. And so to be able to say, hey, we have IP protection on this. No one else is. No one else. They probably can go and do it, but they shouldn't be doing that. Or we could go after them, not in the business of going after anybody. The trademarks aren't to go after anybody. They're protect me and also potential investors or whatever it is down the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, so th- I think that that's can- super important for your listeners to understand too, from a branding standpoint. And no one has ever brought this up. So can you give us a ballpark of like, over or under $5,000 for one trademark? If you just wanted to trademark like the name, Oh, it's under five thousand dollars. So I would say. So I think I. Uh, so it depends. So if you, well, yes. Yeah, so you could do like full clearances, which come at a particular cost, where they basically do in depth research, or they could do like quick research to see if it's available before they start to file. So I would yep. say per trademark. So in the initial phase, it's probably like a thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars, or whatever in the initial to file, but then. After you, let's say, get the uh, initial approval, like we just did with Comfort Elevated, now we are in a phase where they we have to show a statement of use. So you have to show it in a certain way and how you're using it and everything like yeah. that. So you have the statement of use. And then what you can, then it's 750 per mark at that point to get the final okay. filing through. Now, okay. where sometimes where it can get expensive is when... You may have to, let's say they they have a take issue with something and you have your attorney go back and revise. Then something. it's attorney it, fees. It can, get, it can get that way or it it can get, which has happened before, a, a large trademark dispute where someone tries mm. to dispute the trademark. And depending on how that situation goes, it can get very expensive, which has happened. And potentially you could end up without a trademark and still having to pay for all those things. You can. And- it can get ugly sometimes, which it has. Yeah. But, you know, those are the things you need to think about, even if you yeah. don't intend when you start to build a brand. You right. never know what's going to happen to your brand. You have an opportunity. You should protect it anyway. Yeah, this has my wheels turning. I feel like now, more than ever, there is opportunity to create in this universe. And create on your own terms in your yes. own way. But what you need to do is protect that because the time, energy, and emotion that you put into it can so quickly be gone yep. without protection. And so I feel like a lot of these brands, you see a lot of these like cool cabin brands. And I always wonder, I'm like, did they ever go the IP route? I almost want to reach out to everybody and be like, hey, guys. Nobody has mentioned it before. We have talked to a lot, like, I think almost 60 cabin owners in the last year and a couple months, and not one person has ever really? mentioned that. Uh-uh. I, I mean, lock- this is the first time I've thought about it. Literally the first moment lock I've it thought down. about it. It's, it's important because because you take so much time. Like, think about it. You talk to 60 business owners. And you, your circulation on your podcast, the people that you talk to, the people that are asking you for this event or that, that's your community. That's right. amazing. And that just doesn't happen. That takes right. time and effort and it's passion. Mm -hmm. And so it's like doing that, like protection just seems secondary, but just like you said, and we, we, we said like an hour ago, the video production and the branding and all of that stuff as upfront investments, this is another piece of it. If this is going to be your life, this is a piece to protect the investments that you've made. Yeah. Yeah. This is really smart for a lot of folks to think about, especially folks in the early stage, because you have the opportunity to do it right from the beginning. That's it for those of us. Yeah, those of us who are years in, it's not too late. I mean, I know. Okay, friends, we are ending episode one here, and we're going to pick up right where we left off next week and learn more from Sam, not only about the business side, but also about hosting and running a treehouse. 
As always, thank you so much for joining us. And if you liked what you heard, feel free to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or share some of your favorite parts over on Apple Podcasts in a review. If you have feedback or suggestions for the future, you can find me on Instagram at Cozy Rat Cabin. Thanks all. Looking forward to next week.